everyone. Our scripture reading this morning will be taken from the book of John, chapter 19, verses 1 through 5. Let us hear what the word has to say. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Steve Webb and Janet Webb no longer need an introduction. They have been with us since last Sunday and brought us some beautiful lessons and beautiful food. So uh, I'm not going to take up no time at all. I'm going to let Steve get with his lesson. Uh, Steve Webb. It's wonderful to be with you again. And I hope and trust that What we have to say is going to be uplifting, that it will be challenging, and that it will motivate you to be a better child of God than what you were before we met together this morning. A little bit earlier, I heard someone say that in the prayer, I think it was Fred, And in that prayer, he said, you know, may we leave the world out as we come in here. And I know what he was saying, you know. Let's cleanse our hearts, our minds, and let's enter into a worship with our God. But I want to encourage you, when you go out those doors and out into the city, let the world just lay right where they are. And you put on Jesus and you keep on keeping on in Jesus. I was listening to Reggie a few minutes ago, and now that that brother's trying to get up there and preach, and then I'm not going to have no time. (laughs) Because I could tell he was working into that little, there's a little rhythm that you do, and I know this because for 16 years I was uh, invited to the Midwest lectureships, which was all African American except for me. And they like me because I can preach like that, Reggie. Okay? It takes me a little work, but I can, I can do it. And uh, I was in, uh, I was in uh, uh, Cleveland. Cleveland? Yeah, I was in, yeah, I was in Cleveland. And I was with the brothers there and and I'm sitting like over here, like maybe, no, I was on the front seat. So I'm sitting right there. It's right after lunch, and I'm supposed to be coming up soon to speak. So I'm sitting here, and you got all these brothers and their wives and such. They're, they're out there, and this brother gets up in the podium, and he's looking around. He says, I don't see Brother Webb here. <laughs> Is that right? Well, I must be in if he can't see me. (laughs) And then one of the other uh, sermons that I spoke there, the brother gets up, and after I preach, he says, man, this is just like an Oreo cookie. I looked at him, and I said, everybody knows that the white stuffing's the best part of the Oreo, brother. (laughs) It's good to be with you. It's good to preach the Word of God. In case you haven't figured it out, I love preaching. Okay? I uh, someone uh, someone had asked me something about uh, you know when I'm uh, preaching and 
such, you know, when we're teaching in the school and you're training preachers, I would be teaching for five hours a day, five days a week, the Bible all the time. So you get a little bit of sense of things when you're spending that much time teaching. That's not the study time, that's the teaching time every day. And so when we spend our time and when we study, we begin to think of different kinds of things. And so we're going to be looking at this passage of scripture that you heard and it is, of course, about Pilate and about Jesus. And what Pilate said in verse 5 is the text or the title of that sermon, which is, Behold the Man. And as I mentioned in class, we need to be thinking about Jesus all the time and we need to be focusing on him in our lives. And sometimes we don't focus the way that we're supposed to because as Fred was praying, leave the world behind, we have problems out there, don't we? We have to pay the bills. We have to take care of the families. We have to show up to work. We've got problems at work sometimes. Things don't go the way that they should. They're not as smooth as they should. Technology doesn't always work the way it's supposed to. There are problems, okay? But forget about the problems. Focus on Jesus and him crucified. When Paul had, uh, and I believe I mentioned it sometime in my lessons, but Paul said, I didn't come in superiority of speech. But what he does say is that I wanted to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified in you. And that's our purpose, isn't it? To build one another up so that when people see us, they see Jesus. When God looks at us, God sees Jesus. And so when we talk about behold the man, today we're going to talk about behold Jesus. But I hope that Jesus is seen in each and every one of us every day. So as we begin to do this, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of man is this? Now, how many of you have read this passage of scripture a lot? John 19 verses 1 through 5. Have you read it a lot? Occasionally? Sometimes? It says that when Pilate had scourged Jesus, he brought him out. Scourge. A simple little word, isn't it? The Romans called scourging the halfway death. And they weren't joking about it because many men did not survive the scourging. And so when Pilate has looked at Jesus and he's found nothing wrong with this man, he's thinking to himself, I've got to get out of this. Remember that his wife has said, you don't want to have anything to do with this man because I had a dream about this guy. And so... Pilate is trying to, to get rid of his responsibility, and so he thinks, I've got an idea. He's kind of like, you know, I've got a better idea, like that old Ford commercial with the light bulb came on. It, you could see it right above Pilate. I've got an idea. I'll just beat him half to death, and then I'll take him out to the people. I'll show his, his condition. I'll show how the blood is splattered all over his face, how the flesh is hanging down off of his back, how his arms and legs are bruised because in that whip, someone said it's kind of like a cat of nine tails, but it was worse. It's not just on the tip. It's about every eight to ten inches, bone, glass, metal. 
And when that guy began to wear with that whip, he was an expert. And you'll learn how to inflict maximum pain with every snap of that whip. And that thing would whip around. And it would catch Jesus on the face. It would catch him on the shoulders, on the arms. And when Jesus, by the way, as he's there, just so you get a real good picture, the post that he's strapped to is about this high, and he's tied to it like this. There is no way for him to come. There is no way for him to escape. And he is easy prey with this master whip, or whip master, if you will. And he beats Jesus mercilessly. And he is bleeding all over the place, and blood is splattering everywhere. So when you see that verse that says, Pilate scourged him, you think about that. You think about the, the immense pain. And what Pilate has done, I believe, in my own mind, is that he really thought that he could get Jesus set free by doing this. And in my research, and I haven't read everything, but in my research on this subject, I have not found another example of a man being scourged and then crucified. It could be out there, but I have not found that example. Now certainly I'm not going to find it in the book of books, the Bible. But I've searched historical records trying to figure this thing out. And unless I skipped over it, it you know how we skip over things in boring sections of books? I, you know, like so-and-so begat, so-and-so that begat, so-and-so that begat, so-and-so that begat, 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 and we kind of skip over that. Don't do that. Read it through because that's your family history that they're talking about. And if you think, well, I'm, but I'm not a Jew. Well, was Adam a Jew or a human being? Amen. Was Seth a Jew or a human being? Was Noah a Jew or a human being? And you can move that line all the way up to Abraham before you have the first Hebrew, if you will. It's our family history. And the fascinating thing when you're trying to skip over this stuff is you miss little jewels like, well, you know, like Rahab is in Jesus' family line and Bathsheba, or you, you go through here and, you, and Ruth and Rahab and when the Bible makes an exception, like putting women's names in, it's time to pay attention because they only put men's names. And so when you read that, what, what's going on here? Well, you have one that is supposed to be a harlot and she's not a Jew. She's in Jesus' family line. And then you have Ruth, who is also not a Jewess, in Jesus' family line. And you go down through the centuries, and guess what? We are in his family line. Because we have been adopted because God has loved us so much. So when you read about this scourging, you have to understand that it was uncommon, if not unheard of, that they would also be crucified. I've taken some, some whoopings when I was coming up. 
And I shared a little bit about that. But it was nothing compared to the scourging. So when you think about Jesus and you think about his life and all of the different things, you need to behold the man. You need to think about him being tied to that post, being whipped because of our transgressions. Not his, ours. You know, we talk about people and how they, how people lie and they cheat and they steal and all of these different kinds of things. How many white lies have you told? There are no white lies. There are only lies. Half truths are full lies. But it's just a little bit off. Okay, well go get a drink of water, drop just a little bit of arsenic in it and drink it. What do you think's gonna happen? Bye bye, somebody will be preaching your funeral. It's just a little bit of difference. That's all. So behold the man. Think about the ministry of Jesus. When you want to examine this man named Jesus, it's time to look at his ministry and see the different things that are going on for him. Okay? And so behold the man. He's an innocent man. He has taken this scourging, this beating, and we look at him and we say, well, he, this guy's a carpenter. And, and that little thing that he's carrying, you know, you, you see the picture and you see him dragging this cross, right? That's not the way it was. The cross beam is sitting in the place of the skull. Okay, it's there. The long post is there. What Jesus is carrying is that cross piece. It weighs 50 pounds. Why couldn't he carry it? Because he'd been beaten half to death. He'd lost a lot of blood. His body was in physical shock while he's going on the way up to Golgotha's hill to die for our sins. So when we're thinking about him and carrying the cross, it's just that cross beam that he carries. It weighs 50 pounds. Now, I am a weak old man and I can carry 50 pounds for a distance from here to Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I can carry it for a short distance. But I haven't been beaten half to death either. And he had. So when you're reading this story, have a little more empathy about what's going on with Jesus and understand exactly the torture that this man has been under. Remember, that when we began our lessons in, in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, the, uh, the agony of victory in that lesson, remember that when we talked about it, that he had been all day with his disciples. They'd had the Last Supper. We go along, we've come into midnight. He's been praying. And while he's been doing that, a large crowd comes and arrests him. So this guy, by that time, has been up since maybe four or five o'clock in the morning because his custom was to get up early in the morning while it was yet dark. He would do that. And so here's this man who has done all of this. They arrest him. Then they take him to Caiaphas. Then they take him to, to Ananias. Then they, then they drag him to Pilate. Then they drag him over here. Then they drag him over here. And by the time he's crucified, it's 9 o'clock in the morning, and this man has had absolutely no sleep for over what, 24 hours. He's probably been up 28 to 30 hours at this point. 
He's been beaten severely. Behold that man. Think about exactly what has been going on for him. And think about, as you think about that Roman scourging, think about some of the things that I described. And uh, there have been other times when I've done an entire lesson only on the Roman scourging. And fortunately, no one got physically sick, but a couple of people got pretty close to it because it's a very sickening thing. Read about it and study it and you'll find out what I'm talking about. So we think about the effects of this weakening effect. We think about the humility that is there. You have God who has come down into the flesh and allows his creation to beat him, to question him, to mock him, to spit in his face, to slap him, to throw a crown of thorns onto his head and beat it down on his head so that those spikes go into it. Think about the lily of the valley. Or better yet, think about the Rose of Sharon. And I'm sure that you've been told before, but the Rose of Sharon is the only rose in the world that does not have thorns. And Jesus is referred to as the Rose of Sharon. There is no pain in Jesus. We have our own pain that we bring into our lives and the consequences of sin, the consequences of living right for Jesus. Uh, we have, for me, he is an acquaintance. My wife knows him pretty well. He is an elder in the church in Phoenix, Arizona, but he was also a missionary in Thailand. And this good brother went from Thailand into Laos to preach the gospel. And Laos is a communist nation. And he and some of the leaders of that church were rounded up by the secret police and they were thrown into a jail. Now, this friend of ours, because he was an American citizen, was let out after a very short period of time, relatively short, if you're in a Laotian prison. And the church leaders were there for years. And when they got out, they went right back to preaching. And I wonder sometimes how we would respond to that. How would we respond if someone came and beat us like they did Jesus? How would we respond if they, if they beat us with rods like 39, well it was 40, but they saved one to make sure they didn't go over it under the Jewish law? Or take a bambooing, if you will. How would we respond as God's children? Think about the humiliation that we would feel in all of this. Think about Jesus who is going to be, as a Jew, he's going to be very modest, but he is stripped down of all of his clothing for the entire world that's present there to see. How humiliating was that? And. I think about that song, he could have called 10,000 angels. And I think, what strength that he had to have that he wouldn't call them down. I'm pretty sure I would have weirded out and said, in the garden, no, no, I'm coming home now, pops. <laughs> And if I managed to make it to as far as getting beaten, looking up and saying, 
Dad, really? I got to do more? This is not enough? Hey, send those angels down. We're done. These people, they're done too. Time to go. And thank God that he was willing to be humbled. And thank God that he loved us so much he was willing to endure this and the agony that he had to have gone through. I cannot even begin to imagine, let alone describe. And he did it out of love. And why he loved us, I don't know. I hear people say, oh, they're, they're a good person. No, they're not. Amen. There is no, not one good person. There are none righteous. There are people that we like, and we like to say they're good. I like to say, Robert, you're a good man, but Robert and I both know I'd be lying. Because if he said that about me, he'd be lying. And we understand that on a certain level, and yet we speak about people being good. There was no one that has ever walked the earth like Jesus. And if they were trying to walk the earth like Jesus, God said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're coming with me. Whoop, there goes the whirlwind. You and I need to understand this Jesus and to look at his ministry and all of the different things that have been going. Think about how he was so poised in, in everything that he did and how he was so tempered to deal with people. His response was always perfect. My response not so perfect. My response, not so intelligent sometimes. And Jesus brings, or Pilate brings Jesus out, and he says, Behold the man. And here's Jesus. He's holding that reed in his hand. He's got that crown of thorns on his head and the blood drops are coming around. And he's got this purple robe on it because they had been mocking him as a king. And he's standing there before the crowd and he says nothing. He stands as majestic as he can. Because after all, he is the king of kings. There is none that is like him. And I, I mentioned before that, that you know, when they're questioning Jesus and, and he, Jesus is being told, don't you know I have the power of death over you? And Jesus says, the only reason you've got power is because my Father gave it to you. That's the only reason. Any man, any woman that you see that has power, it's because God gave it to them. That's all. For good, for bad, whatever it is, God put them there for a purpose. And maybe that purpose is to lead a nation down into the depths of hell. For the righteousness of the people is what lifts up the nation. And the wickedness of that same nation is what causes that nation to fall. I'm not talking about any particular nation. I'm talking in general. That's the way it works. Israel thought, we're the people of God. We can do whatever we want. We can sin that grace may abound. As Paul would say, God forbid. God sent Nebuchadnezzar. And Israel fell. And many women, they were, they, they were 
take him away and send him to foreign lands. And uh, everyone here, has everyone read the book of Daniel? If you've read the book of Daniel, you, you see that chapter one. And I don't think you've actually discussed chapter one the way chapter one should be discussed. Maybe, I could be wrong, you got, you, you got some good Bible teachers here and if you've lived a few years, you may have heard some really good lessons. But how many people told you when you were studying Daniel chapter one that those young Hebrew men that you read about, you know, when they had their names changed, Meshach, Okay, when you go and you read about them and you read about Daniel, how many people told you how they had their manhood taken away from them because they were castrated? Anybody tell you that? Because that's exactly what happened. They became eunuchs to serve in that household. The people of God trusting in God sometimes endure things for the sake of of God. And through all of that, what do we read about Daniel? He's faithful all of his life. He'll never have children, he'll never be married, but he is faithful all of his life. And to me, that brings my meaning when Jesus is asked about marriage, divorce, remarriage, and all of that, and his disciples come in and say, Oh Lord, that's a hard saying. And he said, yes, it is. And he says, not all men are able to receive this saying, but some, some become eunuchs by the hand of men. Some choose to, are born eunuchs, some by the hands of men, and some choose to become eunuchs for the, for the sake of the kingdom of God. Jesus should remind all of us of what type of a person that we should be. Pilate thought that if he brought Jesus out, if people could see this tortured, mangled body dripping in blood, that they would take mercy on Jesus. He thought that the Jewish people would have a soft heart and they would say, release him. He suffered enough. But Pilate was wrong. The people. He could not appeal to any sense of sympathy because they had none. Why? Because the mob mentality had taken over. And that's a dangerous thing. Now, I grew up here in California, up on the Monterey Peninsula there. But I remember uh, 1968 pretty well. And right here, right there, I've got a spot that I can still feel. It doesn't hurt, but it's a little numb. And that's where I was hit with a brick during a riot that took place up in my city. I understand that the mob mentality causes people that may not get involved in those things normally, that it catches them up and they end up being involved in things that they should not. You know, if you watch people and they're looting and all of the different things that they're doing in the cities as they have here in America over the last few years, that's mob mentality that is taking place. And so if we can understand how mobs think, well, first of all, stay away from it. Because those bricks, they hurt, okay? And so it's, it's important for us to understand that Pilate thought that there would be some sympathy. But there was no sympathy for Jesus. And sometimes 
Sometimes when our brothers and sisters are struggling in sin, we are not very sympathetic either. We, sometimes we forget about these struggles. Maybe we have overcome some of these sin issues that they're dealing with long ago, and we forgot about that pain. I remember when I was preaching in Petaluma, California quite a few years ago and this brother while I was preaching and, and I extended an invitation and he came down, he sat down on the front row, I spoke with him and he said, I need to repent, I want you to pray for me, I need some help because he had become addicted to drugs. And so I I, I talked to the congregation and we, uh, we, we prayed for him and about two weeks later he comes forward again, same issue. So I ask him, you know, did you uh, go to the people that I had sent him to? And he said, well, I couldn't really afford it, etc. We prayed for him again. I talked with the men, we worked out to help him pay for some rehabilitation and we sent him off and he came back. He did okay for a while, he was up again. And after about the fifth or the sixth time that this fellow came forward, I could hear people saying, oh, why didn't he just give up if that's the way he's going to be? If he's not going to do right, he ought to just stay home. And I'm thinking to myself, all you that are perfect cast the first stone. You know, Rich a little while ago said something, if I remember right, he said something about throwing tomatoes at some point. You know? And I remember at a congregation when I felt like they were going to throw tomatoes at me. And I just said, I have one request. Please take them out of the can before you throw them. <laughs> Those are two. So it's important for us to be sympathetic to others when we see them that they are in pain. The people that looked at Jesus, they knew he was in pain. None of them most likely had experienced that scourging. And they should have had a little sympathy seeing this man that had been so weak and was standing there, pathetic, if you will, standing majestic but still pathetic because of the way he looked. No wonder Isaiah said, there was nothing comely about looking at that man. Maybe Isaiah saw him in a vision and saw his beaten condition when he wrote Isaiah 53. And so when we're looking at that ministry, we need to understand that Jesus is trying to, and Robert, since I'll not get through this lesson, you see those three minor points in the first point? Yeah. That'll preach, brother. Okay? So you, you, you can take those three and do something good with it, all right? All right. So, when we're looking at this, there is no way that, that we can adequately describe the agony that Jesus went through. I don't care how good the preacher is, it will be inadequate. However eloquent, however beautiful, however ugly he paints the scene, it is inadequate to describe when you see it with your own eyes. It's like when, when my wife went to uh, the Grand Canyon, you know, she'd seen lots of pictures on YouTube. And when she sees it with her own eyes, she says, wow, I never, with my own eyes. And when you see something with your own eyes, it makes a huge difference. So when you see with your eyes, a brother or a sister that is hurting, make certain that you show the right amount of empathy and 
sympathy. Amen. Mostly empathy. Because you want to identify with them. Don't tell them you know exactly how they feel. <laughs> yeah, those of you that have gone through it, you know, no one knows exactly how you feel when you're going through that. So show some empathy, some understanding. And so the principles of peace, the price of peace and the prince of peace, in this first point of mine, that's really what I would want to say. So, anyone can make a declaration of peace. How many times in the last 20 years have you heard someone say, oh, we got to cease fire? Okay? You can make a declaration, but that doesn't bring peace. You can have a UN resolu resolution? resolution that there will be peace. But just because they say it in New York doesn't mean that the people across the world are going to hold to it. You can write it up, you can leave no loopholes, but people are people. And if they decide they want to shoot at each other, they're going to do it. Why? We talked a little bit about what James said as to why. Because people are greedy. People want what is not theirs. Mr. Putin wants Ukraine back because they had once been in the fold, but they were not always in the fold, but he wants them back. And so he goes after it. China wants Taiwan back. Okay? Everyone wants their stuff back. And so they argue about it. And then that escalates. I remember reading in school one time, and it said that war is the result, or war is, is the extension of failed diplomacy. I don't know if you ever read that in your history books, but I remember reading that sometime. And what we need to understand as God's people is that just because people say there will be peace, there will not be peace. And I know that we pray for peace in the world, but because I'm running out of time, I'm going to tell you before long before I would ever get there this one thing. And that is that peace in the world can only happen if you have peace with God. Amen. And that as you spread that peace that you have with God to your neighbor, to the ones across the street, to the ones in the next county, the next state, the next nation, until we can take Jesus to them and they have peace with God, once we have peace with God, we will have peace with one another. And so maybe when we're praying, instead of praying for peace in Ukraine, maybe pray that people will be converted to Jesus. Spend our time where we need to be spending our time in trying to motivate others so that they can be at peace with God. Without peace with God, there can be no peace at all. And so hopefully we can learn that. And, and, and the idea of the concept of justice, you know, in the Old Testament, God talks a lot about justice. In fact, he wants justice to roll down like the waters. But when sin is involved, justice is and becomes perverted justice. And we seek other things. And so what we see is that crime ends up running rampant. See any of that on your televisions? 
people going into stores and hauling out televisions and no one's being arrested. And the only ones that are shackled or being shackled are the police who are told don't arrest them. Well, if they didn't need it, they wouldn't steal it. Got to love that kind. I, I think I'm going to go, go up the hill here. I see a nice house up there. I think I'll just go steal it and say I needed it. I don't think that would go over too good. So we need to, to look at and we examine Jesus and we see that he wants peace. But it's not the peace of the world. It's the peace of God that we need to be striving for. And so when we're looking at, at Jesus, we need to understand this price. And that price was him being scourged. That price was him dying on the cross. That Christ was allowing evil to rise up to a certain point so that they would be able to crucify the Son of God. So when we think of him, he's standing before Pilate, and he is the perfect example of how costly peace really is. It costs something. It's not free. Someone told my wife that uh, when we were in uh, Las Vegas, we went to a Thai restaurant, and the young man there said, he loves being in America because America is free. And I can tell you that while you're still free, it's not like it was when I was coming up and being free. It's different today. Now, some people may think that's, that it's good different. Some people may think it's a bad different. But it's different. And we recognize that. Because life moves on. Things change. But God is desirous of all of us as brothers and sisters of loving one another, of having peace with one another, of showing the world a better way to live. And sometimes as, as Christians, we just don't think about it. So as we showed you last week, Think about Jesus in the garden. Think about the agony that he had on the last night before, on the night of his betrayal. Think about all of the different things that are going on with him. How he's taken from this person to this person and all these different people. No one is finding Jesus guilty and yet the, he gets beaten. No one finds him guilty and yet he dies on a cross so that you and I might have peace with God. That's why he did it. He loved us and we should love him as well. That's from a song, the battle hymn of the Republic. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom. He transfigures you and me. He changes our lives. And hopefully, hopefully, we keep those lives changed because of that. He is the Prince of Peace. And there are four kinds of peace. The peace of nations that we talked about, the peace with individuals, the peace with the world, and the peace with God. And all we have to do is choose. Do we want to be a friend of the world or a friend of God? And I don't know about you, but I choose God. Because he is the creator. He is my redeemer. And he is my sustainer. I have nothing in this life except that he has chosen to give it to me for me to hold a little while. 
there's, there's a song, and I, I don't know if it's in the songbook, in this songbook, but in that song it talks, basically what it's saying is that Jesus gave everything to me for a little while, just so that I could be sabai sabai, <laughs> if you will. That life is easy. So the things that we have, God gives it to us for our enjoyment, for our stewardship, that we can use it to his glory, for his honor, so that we might bring other people in. So if God has given you a house, invite people in so they can see Jesus in you. If God has given you a car, Bring people with you when you come to worship him. If God has given you a voice, lift it up. If God has not given you a voice, lift it up anyway if it's coming from the heart. Because that's what God is looking for in each and every one of us. He's looking for us to exhibit the peace that we have that is inside of us that only God can give us and no man can rob that peace from us. Just like they can't take our joy. I remember going through a really rough time and, and this individual kept getting angrier and angrier with me because I just kept singing songs of praise to God. How can you sing that blah, 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 blah? Because my hope is in my Lord. And whatever circumstances are going on, they don't matter. Everything here is transitory. You know, this beautiful building, one day this will be nothing but rubble. And all of the beautiful people that are here, one day you'll be far more beautiful in the presence of God if you are living faithful to him. And so we need to know that peace and we need to understand what the true peace of God is. And sometimes as Christians we, so, well sometimes as human beings we just like to fight. My wife and I sometimes will get up, want to fight today? And then she'll, sometimes we'll be driving in the car and we'll be having a discussion and teasing her. She's sitting over uh, in Thailand, you're driving here, and your steering wheel is here and the passenger sits over here, not like in America. And I'm sitting there and I'm driving and she'll be sitting over here and she'll go and put her fist right there and just touch it and say, I say, oh, sweetheart, that felt so good. Would, would you do it to the other side, please? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes as we try to live in peace, conflict is unavoidable. And my friends, when we are teaching and preaching Jesus, I guarantee you that conflict is unavoidable. When, when people have no conflict ever in their life, they're not talking to enough people about Jesus. My mother and my father never obeyed the gospel. My father died of, uh, of brain cancer. My mother died of liver failure. And neither of them obeyed the gospel before they died. I sat down with them after I became a Christian and I opened up the word of God and I tried to share it with them. But because I was their son, there was a difficulty with that. And they thought, this is just a phase that Steve is going through. 
And I suppose it is. It's only been going on for, I don't know, 48 years now, <laughs> this phase I got going on. And, but I remember, and I always remember, and this will show my father's ignorance, if you will. He opens up the Bible. It was a King James Bible, and he opens it up, and he said, see this right here? This proves that this is man's work, because it says authorized by King James. Mm -hmm. And I looked at him, and I felt like, what am I going to do with this? And through the years, they finally realized that it was real for me, but they did not obey. And the last time that I saw my mother alive, she said, are you going to preach to me again? And I said, Mom, I'm not going to preach for you. You already know your eternal destination. And you have a choice. And if you want to try to serve God in these final months of your life, I'm happy to help you to do that. But if, if you're unwilling to do it, or, or if you think you're doing it to please me, you will be eternally lost. And it breaks my heart. And as I told you the other day, I don't want to see my mother or my father ever again. And I, I've had brothers and sisters say, well, you're judging. No, the Word of God judged that already. The Word of God said that if you do not believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. That's what the Word says. I'm not saying it. Jesus said it. He said that if you believe me that I am he, then keep my commandments. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would tell you, but now I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. What a wonderful promise that Jesus has made. He wants us to have peace with God. And when we have that peace, eternal life is ours. And again, no one can take that from us. I will tell you that while I was unsuccessful with my father and my mother, that my grandmother, who had been a Pentecostal all of her life, obeyed the gospel at the age of 73, and she passed at the age of 78 in Christ and faithful to the Lord. So I look forward to seeing Grandma, to spending time with her. I look forward to seeing Sister Sheer, Grandma Sheer, sweet little lady in Christ that I came to know in my first ministry. I look forward to seeing Brother Bob McCallum again. There are many that I look forward to seeing and some I never want to ever look upon their face again because if I do, I know I will be lost. As Paul said, you know, he's, he's preaching the gospel to people and he makes a statement about how he is concerned. He was confident, make no mistake, but God is sovereign and God can do whatever he wants. And if after we spend our lifetime in faithfulness to him as we see faithfulness, and he chooses to do something other than grant to us heaven, he is sovereign. And we need to understand, you know, Paul at one point, 
he said, I, I, I would be willing myself to be anathema if my brethren would be saved. And I'm thinking to myself, what if God saved some of those Jews because of Paul's prayer? And he answered Paul's prayer with, okay. I, as much as I love people, will not make that prayer. And it's important to me that each of you know that you are loved by God. You know that you are loved by one another. But we will hold you dear. And I hope and trust that we have said things that have encouraged you, that have inspired you, that have challenged you, that have caused you to think about some of these scriptures in a different way than what you have looked at them before. They are not dry, musty words in a book. They are alive, and there is feeling, and there is power in these words. If we only get our minds into the right perspective. So I hope and trust that in this past week that I've been able to help you to open your eyes and your heart to look at God's word in a refreshing way that you can glorify God all the days of your life. And I look forward to seeing you all above. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May God help you in your everyday lives that Jesus is truly your all as he is for mine. As together we stand and sing a song of encouragement. Jesus is standing in heart.